This is Ham College, episode 49 for January 31st, 2019. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Create your own band opening with ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, coming soon. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Ham College. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And it's great to be back with you. And uh, yeah, I think it did change colors, Tommy. It did change color, but you don't have a hole in you, so yeah. I think it's okay. This is from the old college days. How many days. fingers am I holding up? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually <laughs> green, but it doesn't look actually green right there. Yeah, close. But it didn't make a hole in it. Didn't so. make a hole in it, so that's good enough. What did we do last time? Well, hell yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. ask. Uh, we must have talked about modulation and transmission line. No, I think that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Well, it says more. What was in the last episode? Oh, over modulation. We did some of that this mor this uh, little while ago, this yep. morning. It's been a long day. Yep. Over modulation and, and <coughs> test, some test equipment some last test. month. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I bet no one could guess what the topic is going to be tonight. Well, not that anybody gave it away. <laughs> modulation and, uh, and some transmission okay. line questions on this one. You know, anytime we're doing a live show, we've got the chat room going at the same time. If you want to join in the chat there and help answer some of these questions for us where can you do that you can join us at amateurlogic.tv forward slash chat um there's a good group of people in there it's a, a lot of fun going on in the chat room matter mm -hmm. of fact uh, we we try to monitor it while we're taping here and uh try to interact with it as much as we can why is the time delay sometimes included in a transmitter keying circuit a to prevent stations from interfering with one another b to allow the transmitter power regulators to charge properly. C, to allow time for transmit receive changeover operations to complete before RF output is allowed. Or D, to allow time for a warning signal to be sent to other stations. Well, I think this one, I think most folks will probably get this one. Um, to allow time for a warning signal to be sent to other stations, no. <laughs> I don't ever recall hearing that. I've never heard a warning. No. Nope. Uh, let's see. A, to prevent stations from interfering with one another. Mm. Now, yeah, I could see where maybe you would say that, but nah, that's not it. B, to allow the transmitter power regulators to charge properly. That's, um, that's some made-up junk there, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's... That's all I can say about that one. I think most of us would say that it's going to be C, to allow time for transmit, receive, changeover operations to complete properly before RF output is allowed. That, that's that going to makes, be the answer right That was right one there. that makes sense. That's what everybody... How long does is, it take to charge your power regulators? I'm not even sure what they are. There you go. Nailed it. Here, boy, See, we hadn't yeah. done that in a while. We hadn't. All right, well, let me throw one your way. Okay, hit me. How is the efficiency of an RF power amplifier determined? Is it A, divide the DC input power by the DC output power? B, divide the RF output power by the DC input power? C, multiply the RF input power by the reciprocal of the RF output power? Or D, add the RF input power to the DC output power. Ooh. 
I should have got the first one and left you this one. How is efficiency of an RF power amplifier determined? Divide the DC input by the DC output. Divide the RF output by the DC input. That sounds plausible. Multiply the RF input by the reciprocal RF input power to the DC output power. That's a, the only one that looks like it makes sense to me would be B. Divide the RF output power by the DC input power. B. Uh, I, B. Yeah. Maybe a buzzer going on there, here. But. There's a little <coughs> mixed uh, over in the chat room on it. Most of them are... C and A. I was going to say most of them are saying B, but no, actually most of them aren't saying anything. So, yeah, I don't blame them. Yeah. Uh, I, the only one that makes sense to me would be B. Um, okay. Divide the RF output power by the DC input power because that's the product. The DC is the input and the RF is the product. But what's, what's wrong divide, with answer A? Divide the DC input by the DC output. Are we, are we putting out DC power? No. <laughs> well, that would probably be what's wrong with it. <laughs> that would probably be, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's just see. There you go. Okay. I, I knew you had had nailed that one right there. But we can prove this out if you happen to have a calculator. First, we're going to have to figure the DC input. So that is going to be, for a tube circuit, is going to be plate voltage times plate current. It'd be the same thing on a solid state circuit, whatever the voltage is and the current. This transmitter runs 8,300 volts. And let's say the current is, let's just say 3.8 amps. You multiply the voltage sum, the current being applied to the final stage, that gives you the DC input power to that. 31,540 mm -hmm. by watt meter says that this is 23,000 watts. Now divide that by the other figure we had. 31,540. Yep, that's our input power. 0.729, so that means that the amplifier is 73% efficient. 73% efficient. And actually, those figures I gave you were a little bit off there because this one particular one's about 79% efficient. Kind of how that works out. And there you got it. What is the reason for neutralizing the final amplifier stage of a transmitter? A, to limit the modulation index. B, to eliminate self oscillations. C, to cut off the final amplifier during standby periods. Or D, to keep the carrier on frequency. What is the reason for neutralizing the final amplifier stage of a transmitter? Well, to keep the carrier on frequency. No, it doesn't have anything to do with that. To cut off the final amplifier during standby periods. Shouldn't have anything to do with that. This is another one. I only see yeah. one that seems like it might be the right answer. To limit the modulation index. Now, how do you index to, your modulation? To eliminate self oscillations. That's your answer right there. It's number B. Number, <laughs> number yeah. B. Yeah, and that's what uh, the few that answered in the chat room are saying. Yep. Number it, B. It is B, to eliminate self-oscillations, and that's something else that, you know, we have to do on uh, tube-type amplifiers <clears throat> commonly. Hmm. Um, because if you've got self-oscillations going on, there's a couple of things going on. First, you are putting out other stuff out of your transmitter than, than what you want to be putting out. And you're also wasting power because those self-oscillations aren't free. They take some power. So your efficiency would go down as well. Although that's not part of this. It's just an observation. Uh -huh. Because it, you know, if the amplifier is oscillating, that's, that's not a good thing. So what's, uh, to neutralize the final amplifier stage, what's involved in doing that? You're neutralizing out these byproducts that you don't want. Typically, it's adjusting a capacitor um, or an inductor. 
inside the final amplifier circuitry. On uh, the ones I have, there's a little ring that's around the tube socket. It's got these two little sliders and you move them farther apart or closer together until you've eliminated it. And you can watch some of the meter readings and such and kind of tell when you've eliminated it. But you can't do that while there's power on. It, it wouldn't be good. You get neutralized? You get neutralized yourself, yeah. <laughs> huh. Interesting. Neutralized, huh? What is the stage in a VHF FM transmitter that generates a harmonic of a lower frequency signal to reach the desired operating frequency? Is it A, the mixer? B, reactance modulator? C, preemphasis network? Or D, Multiplier. Ooh. What is the stage in a VHF FM transmit generates a harmonic of a lower frequency? Reach the desired operating frequency. A harmonic. A mixer. I don't think I don't think it's a mixer. Reactance modulator. Pre-emphasis network. Generate a harmonic. Mm -hmm. So that's dealing with the frequency. That's not the modulator. I think it's going to be D. I'm not sure what a pre-emphasis network is. I think it's D. I'm just guessing, though. Multiplier. Well, yeah, that's slim I've answers. Heard, I've heard multi, I've heard multiplier mm -hmm. as, as one of the components. Yeah, the answer's a little slow coming in on the chat room on this one, too. But I'm... Mixer? A, I don't think it's a mixer. No, the majority of them, though, are saying it's D, a multiplier. Re Reactant small. It's got to it's gotta be D. That's the only one... Mm -hmm. Just process of elimination from things that make sense to me. It seems like it's D, but I, I don't know. Maybe getting buzzed here. Where's the meal? No, there you go. You're right. I'm sweating, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was my line from earlier yeah, in the show. Yeah, it's true. Um, if you think about it, though, that, that kind of makes sense because it's generating a harmonic of a lower frequency. So it's multiplying a lower frequency. Mm -hmm. up to the operating frequency. Yeah, well, that's, that's, and that was a train of thought with the, mm -hmm. so, with the harmonics and the multiples. Mm -hmm. Well, that was it. That was good work there, Dean. Good guessing. That was all skill, man. I saw it happen That was right guess. There. Do you see the sweat? They still got sweat popping that, out on No, I'm about to sweat man. right here. This oh, is, yeah? Yeah. Okay. What is the name of the process that changes the instantaneous frequency of an RF wave to convey information. A. Frequency convolution. B. Frequency transformation. C. Frequency conversion. Or D. Frequency modulation. That's con frequency convolution. That's convoluted. Yeah. Well, frequency transformation is kind of transformative. What is the name of the process that changes the instantaneous frequency of an RF wave to convey information? All right, so this process is changing the frequency. It's not changing the amplitude of the frequency. It's changing the frequency itself of an RF wave to convey information. Sounds to me like mm -hmm. it's uh, D, frequency modulation. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. Because making the changes... It, it, to the signal is modulation, and since the frequency is what we're changing, that's got to be it. It's D, frequency modulation. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of folks answering that one in the chat room here, so I, I feel pretty good about my answer. Now that All right, I have a special one for you here. Oh, boy. Well, I know you got a special <coughs> one for me coming up right after. Do I? Yeah. Okay. I'll take your word for it. What is the total bandwidth of an FM phone transmission oh. having 5 kilohertz deviation and 3 kilohertz modulating frequency? Is it A, 3 kilohertz, 
B, 5 kilohertz. C, 8 kilohertz. Or D, 16 kilohertz. Ooh, 5 kilohertz of deviation. Now 3 kilohertz modulating. And the chat room is silent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a couple of guesses. This is going to be a guess here, another one. Now, come on now, do it scientifically. I don't know how to, <laughs> about measuring the deviation. Three kilohertz. Three kilohertz modulation. I mean, I want to say it's C, 8, 8 kilohertz, because of, just because of the simple math, but that can't be the right answer. I'm trying to figure out why it's not the right answer. Well, if it helps any, they have guessed every answer in the chat room except A. Okay, so I'm not going to pick A. But you won't know that when you take your exam. Three kilohertz, FM phone. I'm trying to remember, isn't that six? I think it's going to be D. You think? Why? Why do you say because that? Because I'm thinking it's. Uh, Eight kilohertz above and below the center. Why do you think it's eight? Because of three kilohertz modulation, five deviation. E. Andy says it's a e, it's E, and I'm I'm inclined to go with the E. Yeah. So you're saying, how do you solve this then? I don't. I'm I'm just pulling a number out of. <laughs> Out of the air. <laughs> well, we did finally say, have an A. I'm going with D. You're Thank going with D. I'm going with D. I'm, I'm guessing, man. I don't know. I'm going to get buzzed here, so go ahead and hit me. This was a perfect opportunity for a buzz, and you just totally blew it. Did I? Yeah. So that was right then. That was right. So it's above. It's it's a above the the center line. There. Well, yeah. You add. The deviation and the modulating frequency together, that's 5 plus 3 is 8. And then you multiply it by 2 because, yeah, you're on both sides of the carrier. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you can see it plain as day. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I, that was a lucky guess. Most of them did say D, but there was a... There was a lot of split there in, in the answers. And, you know, just to help you totally redeem yourself, why don't you answer this next one here, too? And then I won't have to. No. You don't get, you, you know the answer, I'm sure. What's the frequency deviation for a 12.21 megahertz reactance modulated oscillator in a 5 kilohertz deviation? 146.52 megahertz FM phone transmitter. That's even tough to say. Yeah. A, 101.75 hertz. B, 416.7 hertz. C, 5 kilohertz. Or D, 60 kilohertz. What is the frequency deviation for a 12.21 megahertz reactance modulated oscillator? And a 5 kilohertz deviation, 146.52 megahertz FM phone transmitter. Ooh. This, this question should be on the extra exam, I think. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to take a stab at it. Okay. Because it's 5 kilohertz of deviation. That's not highly unusual. That's a little, maybe... A little lower than I would have expected for an analog, but I'm just going to say 60 kilohertz D there is way too broad. That's way, way too broad a signal. Uh, 5 kilohertz 
Mm, you could almost think that's the answer. 101.75 hertz. Now that's that's not that just doesn't seem like enough swing in the frequency to do much work. I'm going to say it's 416.7 hertz, and that's just a stab at it because I, um, well, I don't know a better way to answer it. Let's see. I'm in good company in the chat room because they're saying it's CDB A 416.7. What about the good book of Gordo? The good book of Gordo. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's, let's see what, uh, my friend Gordon West, WB6NOA, who is a famed author of amateur radio books. He is. What do he has to say? What is the frequency deviation of a 12.21 megahertz reactance modulated oscillator and a 5 kilohertz deviation 146.52 megahertz phone transmitter? Gordo says... The deviation of any frequency modulated transmitter is increased when you follow the oscillator with the frequency multiplier. Okay. In fact, the deviation is multiplied by exactly the same factor as the radio frequency. If we multiply the oscillator frequency by 12, to get to the final output frequency. Let's try that. Okay, well, 12.21 mm -hmm. times 12. Times 12. 446.52, that's the frequency. Okay, this means that if the final deviation is 5 kilohertz, we can divide that by 12 to come up with the required oscillator deviation. So if we take 146.52, divide it by 12.21, what have we got? 12. All right. So now if we take the 5,000 and divide it by 12, 416.7? Yep, 416.666667, which is 7. Okay. You can always trust you know, the Book of Gordo. Yeah, we, we recommend it besides just your studies here at Ham College and uh, your studies with the online uh, questions, you know, where you can go to the question and answer websites like <laughs> Ham Study. Mike says it was his understanding there would be no math. <laughs> yeah, you were wrong, Mike. <laughs> Actually, there was no math. <laughs> or very little. Put it there was incorrect math. Yeah. So uh, we recommend that you <laughs> you check out Gordon West Amateur Radio Study Guides. No matter what exam you're taking, technician, general, or extra. Yeah, I mean, he he does a great job of explaining all that stuff in the back. Exactly. We we do, but nobody knows everything. I mean, but Gordo. Try to, but, but Gordo, Gordo. your he apparently does know everything. <laughs> I will ask him that next week on the Ham Nation. Okay. We'll, we'll find out. So it's time for me to ask you one. What is the name of the process that changes the phase angle of an RF wave to convey information? Is it uh, phase convolution? Uh, B, phase modulation. C, angle convolution. Or D, radian inversion. Well, since we're changing the phase angle of the RF wave, I'm going to go with phase modulation B. You think it's phase modulation B? We'll give them a second to catch up here in the chat room and see what they say. <clears throat> it's convoluted, but I think it's <laughs> modulated. Since we're conveying information... Phase modulation. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty obvious. It it almost is so obvious that they want to make you think that answer is too easy. That is convoluted. The impression I get. Yeah, but it is phase modulation. So there. Have you got one more for me? Uh, I think I can come up with one more. 
What emission is produced by a re reactance modulator connected to a transmitter RF amplifier stage? A. Multiplex modulation. B. Phase modulation. C. Amplitude modulation. Or D. Pulse modulation. What emission is produced by a reactance modulator connected to a transmitter RF amplifier stage? A reactance modulator. That means the reactance is going to be changed by the modulation, which in turn is going to, I could say it could shift the phase or the frequency of it, but frequency modulation is not a choice there. Uh, I know it's not multiplex modulation. I'm going to say it's phase modulation. I know it's not amplitude modulation or pulse modulation. It's got to be uh, phase modulation. modulator. Okay. Uh, so, I probably would, if that's right, I probably would have guessed this one wrong then. Well, here, why don't you answer this one? No, you already did it. Okay. B. Phase modulation. They all got it right over in the chat room. So. I tell pretty you what, smart out there. They are. They are. And pretty when they're not. They do. They just go silent. They don't say anything. <laughs> so. You know. Yeah. You know. It's going to be a hard one if you don't see one character uh, yeah. messages. Nobody says up there. a word. Like, uh oh. Yeah. Well, let's take a break. Get a message from Icom, and then come right back because we got more excitement to go yet. All right. Create your own band opening with the IC ninety seven hundred. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, is coming soon. This new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Attention all hams! ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest and ICOM booth setup. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com slash hams. Well, why don't, to celebrate, we give away something. Hey, how about this hat and shirt? Well, it just happened yeah. to be right here. Just happened to be there every time. <laughs> yep. Got a nice Icon ball cap and a nice Icon ham crew t-shirt. Look, again, like I always say, you'll look just as good coming to the ham fest as you do leaving. And if you'd like to win that, what you need to do is send an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv. And uh, you can, all you really got to have is an email address and a name. Pretty much got that yeah. covered. You don't have to have a call sign. You will probably want an address, though, so they can ship it somewhere, but you don't have to put that in the email. Uh, as a matter of fact, you don't really have to give us a message in there. You can if you want to, and we'd be glad to hear what's on your mind. Yep. Uh, but we had a winner for this month, our drawing. We chose David Shelton, N4IN. Congratulations, David. You'll be hearing from ICOM pretty soon, uh, pretty shortly, and uh, they'll get your stuff out to you. Yep. That's what you got to look forward to. If, okay. you, if you didn't win this time, the, the, and you did enter, the names did not carry over to next month. So yeah. go back and enter again, and you know maybe you'll get uh, next month. Keep going till you win. Yep. Just uh, keep her in each month. Eventually, you will win. Maybe. It's right, a good chance. It's a good chance. That's pretty good odds. 
Okay, back into the questions. Who asked who the last one? I think I you. asked you the last one. All right. Well, then I will ask you this one. I think I did anyway. In what units is RF feed line loss usually expressed? Is it A, ohms per 1,000 feet? B, decibels, decibels per 1,000 feet? Is it C, ohms per 100 feet? Or D, decibels per 100 feet? And I just so happen to know this one because we talked about it the other day. But I, uh, it's going to be D, decibels per 100 feet. Um, yeah, the answers aren't quite coming in the chat room yet. They should be coming in there pretty soon. Well, we're getting a B there. Uh, we yeah, got a D. D. Yeah, so. I answered too quick. Uh, some more Ds. The B changed his mind to a D. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to say You can it's do D. that. That's allowable. Yeah, it, it's D. There we go. Decibels per 100 feet. How would you know that? Well, if you look up the specs on uh, any coax cable or feed line, you're going to find where they're specifying the loss. It's, it's almost, in, in American, it's almost always loss in decibels per 100 mm -hmm. feet. If you put it at 1,000 feet, think about it. That's a little harder to number to work with. Yeah. You know. But the, virtually always, it, it's measured decibels per 100 feet. It's 10 feet. times harder than 100. That's the reason you're a dean. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are the typical characteristic impedances of coaxial cables used for antenna feed lines at amateur stations? A, 25 and 30 ohms. B, 50 and 75 ohms. C, 80 and 100 ohms. Or D, 500 and 750 ohms. What are the typical characteristic impedance of coaxial cables used for antenna feed lines at amateur stations? I think everybody should get this one right. Um, uh, mostly, if you've, yeah. put, if you've, if you've never done any of that any, before, yeah, you, maybe so you would possibly. Uh, but anyway, let's just go over them. 25 and 30 ohms. I've never seen a 25 or a 30 ohm coax. And don't care to. And don't care to. Theoretically, it's possible, but I just, just uh, I've never seen them offered for sale. Uh, D, 500 and 750 ohms. No, that's, that's a really high impedance to be a coaxial cable. They're normally lower than that. C, 80 and 100 ohms. Uh, I have seen some 100 ohm coax before. I'm not sure about 80. But still, we don't see it in the ham shack. I say the answer is going to be B, 50 ohms and 75 ohms, because virtually all the cable that, that we would normally use in ham radio is going to be a 50 ohm cable. But, we might take advantage of a readily available coaxial cable from like cable TV or television antennas, which would be 75 ohms. Mm -hmm. So we, we will use 75 <clears throat> ohms occasionally. So I'm going to say it's uh, B, 50 and 75 ohms. And over in the chat room, yeah, they're, they're saying B. So let's see. And it is B, 50 and 75 ohms. Easy enough on that one, at least mm -hmm. for me it was. It's it pretty was, common. Yeah, and most pretty this common. is a general test, so most of the people that have done this have already done the technician and probably used plenty They've of fifty ohm, used 50 ohm coat yeah. cable, I'm sure. Yep. More than likely. Okay. What is the characteristic impedance of flat ribbon T V type twin lead? Is it A fifty ohms? B seventy five ohms. C, 100 ohms. Or D, 300 ohms. Uh, that flat ribbon TV type twin lead cable, that's going to be 300 ohms, D. It's gonna, I'll in, I'm inclined to agree with you. 
I'll give them a moment over here. Do you think you could pull us up a photo of flat ribbon TV cable there oh, just to yeah, show up? I didn't get one ahead of time, and you know there, there could be some young folks who've never seen that because it would be pretty unusual today. It is D 300 ohms, so you nail that one. Almost everybody's television antenna was connected with 300 ohm twin lead. Mm -hmm. Uh, later, we started going to 75 ohm coax, but in the beginning, it was always 300 ohm twin lead. And there was an advantage to the twin lead is the loss is a little bit less there. But the uh, the coaxial cable, 75 ohms, the shielding, you know, maybe helped keeping some interference and uh, garbage out. So that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of a blast from the past, man. Cause I've uh, I remember doing a lot, using a lot of that stuff. Look oh, yeah. up to those two screw terminals on the back of the television. Yep, that used to be the only kind of antenna connector on a television mm -hmm. or an FM radio. Okay, which of the following factors determine the characteristic impedance of a parallel conductor antenna feed line? A, the distance between the centers of the conductors and the radius of the conductors. B, the distance between the centers of the conductors and the length of the line. C, the radius of the conductors and the frequency of the signal. Or D, the frequency of the signal and the length of the line. Well, I think we can figure this one out pretty easy. Characteristic impedance is not really specifying a a frequency there. So D, the frequency of the signal and the length of the line. That that wouldn't uh, represent the characteristic impedance. Um, C, the radius of the conductors and the frequency of the signal. That wouldn't either, because the frequency you know is not really going to affect the impedance so much. B, the distance between the centers of the conductors and the length of the line. The distance between the centers, yeah, that's valid, but the length of the line, that's, that's irrelevant to determine the characteristic impedance. So it's A, the distance between the centers of the conductors and the radius of the conductors, how big around they are. That'll, that'll have some effect on it, too. So I'm going to say it's A. Everybody in the chat room is saying it's A. There we go. Cool. Well, there's a lot of A's there. Yeah, A. All Canadian. How does the attenuation of coax cable change as the frequency of the signal it is carrying increases? A, attenuation is independent of frequency. B, attenuation increases. C, attenuation decreases. D, attenuation reaches a maximum at approximately 18 megahertz. I'm going to go ahead and scratch that off the possibilities right there. Because 18 megahertz doesn't mean anything. Attenuation change, collects change as the frequency of the signal it is carrying increases. Attenuation is independent of frequency? No. Attenuation increases. It, that's it, it be attenuation increases because you got more loss. The higher the frequency, more loss, so there's less signal to mm -hmm. the end. So I'm, I'm going to go with B, attenuation increases. Everybody in the chat room, it's saying it's B. So there you go. Attenuation increases. And we're going to prove that out here in just a few minutes. Yeah, I can't wait to see how you do that. That would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. What percentage of power loss would result from a transmission line loss of 1 dB? A, 10.9%. B, 12.2%. C, 20.5%. R, D, 25.9%. What percentage of loss of power would result from a transmission line loss of 1 dB? 3 dB would be about 
thinking that's about half. Yeah, each 3 dB is double. Yep, so this is a third of that. I'm just going to take a stab at it because just right off the bat here, I, although I'm a professor and I should know the answer to this. We're going to have to look this up in the Book of Gordo, too. Well, we may have to. 24.5%. Wait. C. Wait. Well, they're all over the place in the chat room, too. 24.5%. That was your guess? That was my guess. Yeah. How'd you come up with that? How'd I come up with that? Could well, you typed it in? I figured a 3 dB loss is going <clears> to <throat> be about 50% of your power gone. Mm -hmm. So a third of that would be... 16 yeah, and there was no answer for that. No, nope. so that was the closest guess would be twenty point five. But the, but we now we need to look it up in the Book of Gordo and see why. Yeah, <clears throat> wish the Book of Gordo would tell us why we're both so hoarse tonight. Yeah, probably it's probably in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> On your examination, Gordo says it will be expected that certain things are committed to memory. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That's true. In the real world of ham radio, there are charts that are available for this information. In this question, they ask the percentage loss for a transmission line of 1 dB. 1 dB of loss results in 0.795, or 79.5% of the energy, making it through the coax, leading to 20.5% getting lost in the transmission line. 100% minus 79.5% equals 20.5% loss. 1 dB loss means you're going to get, you know, 79.5% through. Yeah, um, yeah, you're going to have to memorize it. Or take a guesstimate like I did there, which did not give me the exact answer. But kind of narrowed it down a little bit for me. I mean, that's it. You just can't argue with Gordo on it. Nope. I would never. That was the end of the electronics questions for tonight. Okay. So now it's time to play. It, well, yeah. It will come back and play in just a minute, but first, I don't know, maybe you want to grab a snack or something, uh, or maybe you just want to watch this important announcement. Are you new to the ham world? or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level, study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbean, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. We were talking about this right here. This is RG8U. There's a couple of different types there. There's a Belden 8214. Over on the right-hand side, there's a chart for the JSC brand of RG8U, which is cool. And I've got 100 feet of that. This came from, uh, I thought there was a name on here, the company who sold it. Cable Experts. We're going to use that short one first. Thing. Okay. Uh, RG8U. You know, just a uh, big coax. I, I take this out to field day every year. Mm -hmm. That's, so I'll use it on HF. And RG8U. 
No, that's fine. Tommy right here, on the other hand, has a piece of, I believe that's RG400. The short piece. That is a uh, that is very good cable there. You'll see that used on test equipment a lot. It's very low loss. It's um, very temperature stable. It's just excellent cable. Has a lot of power, too, for a small piece of coax. Yeah. We've got a couple of adapters on the end because that cable has uh, BNC connectors on it. And so we're going to put adapters on it to convert that over to uh, type in. And on the spectrum analyzer here, there's a couple of different ports on the front of that. There's the tracking generator output. This is an oscillator that puts a signal out that we can use to test with. This is the input to the uh, actual spectrum analyzer itself. So if you will connect the cable up between the two there, we're just going to take a look at what it would be. Now, this is a short piece of cable uh, with, you know, it's going to be good low loss. So we're just going to see how our analyzer behaves. Turn on the tracking generator first, and that's going to make the oscillator work inside here. All right, and then we're going to set a frequency. So we're going to measure 1 megahertz. That's minus 10. There's our signal going across here. This is one megahertz okay so our, our reference level here is uh 10 db there's no roll off it's the same level all the way across yeah it looks pretty flat so that means there's no loss hope there wouldn't be between yeah. that but. okay well let's uh let's, let's look at the span we were looking at here this side over here that's 200 hertz wide so that's not Really all that wide. Let's open the span on up some. Well, let's make it uh, one megahertz wide. See, there's a slight amount of roll-off coming over here. I'm going to put a marker on here so that we can easily move around. See that one right there? Wherever I put that, that's going to tell me what frequency we're looking at. So that's 500 kilohertz. That's half a megahertz there. Okay. All right, let's let's open that span up on a little more. Let's make it a two megahertz span. All right. Now we're looking from essentially uh, zero over there. No, I changed my center frequency. All right. So back to one megahertz. We can see when we're down real low at the bottom of the spectrum here. You see how that's dropped off? Well, that's because this thing only works down to 9 kilohertz. Oh. Uh, you can't see that. It's right out of the shot. So, essentially what I'm trying to show here, though, is that there's very little roll-off as we go on out. I mean, like, you know, less than a, a dB there. Now, if we increase that frequency, let's, um, let's run it on up to, say, 100 hertz. And this is not really the cable we're going to want to test. No, 100 megahertz, excuse me. Let's uh, open the span up a little bit wider there. Let's say, uh, let's make it 100 megahertz wide. We can still see that there's it's very pretty, little roll It's pretty flat. That's pretty flat. So this is, this is good cable here, but there's a short piece is, of it. Yeah, it's two feet of it. So we're not going to see much loss there. All right, now let's pull this cable off. And let's go over to our 100 feet of RG8U here. And, of course, this is going to have PL259s on it. So we'll have to use adapters for that. Which just happened to be on the wrong cable right now. What are the chances of that? Pretty good. Yep. 50-50. Being that we've got another piece of cable we're going to look at after we look at the RG8. RG8U, excuse me. hundred feet there. 
official field day coax of champions. Yep, some of you talked to us on through that coax. Yep. Think we're gonna make it out to field day out in the woods this year? I think we're gonna try if the weather will permit. There we go. Which it hasn't the last couple of years. Okay, we've gone back now to uh, to one megahertz. Let's see what we got here. As I said, the the little bump in the roll off here on this end that's just because the analyzer won't go that low. But if we look on out this way, uh, let's let's check our span there. Well, it's a two megahertz span, so we're okay there. Very little roll off out here where this one is. That's one megahertz right there. Center frequency. No, center frequency is one megahertz. That marker out there is two megahertz right there. So very little roll off there. Now, according to our chart, well, how much roll off should we have? At one megahertz, we should have 0 0.1 dB of loss. That's for the Belden RG8. Uh, they don't give that spec over there for the JSC brand, so we'll just have to move on there. But 0 0.1 dB for 100 feet, and we can kind of verify, yeah, that's probably about right there. Let's increase it on up to the next step. Let's, let's say we try this at 10 megahertz. There's our marker right there. And that's that's nine, 9 megahertz. So we're not we're not seeing much loss there either. It's practically flat. Yeah. If you put that on up into UHF frequencies yep. though. At ten megahertz it got a half a dB of loss for hundred feet. And you know, looking here it looks better than that, which mm -hmm. is probably deceiving. Let's jump on up. Let's go to a uh, hundred megahertz. That's 100 megahertz right there. Now, uh, if we come down here to, uh, say, around a reference level, we, we can see right down here around 12 megahertz. Now, we're, we're just a little over minus 10 dB. If we scoot on down to uh, 100 megahertz, we are down like uh, one and a half dB. What they're saying there is uh, 1.7. That's Fairly for the close. Belden. The uh, JSC brand says 1.8. We're kind of in the ballpark there. Now, what we have not calculated into the equation is there's some loss in those connectors and there's some loss in those adapters that we're using. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, now let's, let's go on up. Uh, where do you want to try next? You want to try... Uh, it's going up into the 400, into UHF. All right, so and if you're going to try to use this cable on UHF. Mm -hmm, that's a practical application for yeah. us. So let's say 400 megahertz. Yeah. Uh, which would still be a little lower. Yeah. We're down to uh, minus 14.75 roughly. Oh, wow. So we've dropped about uh, 4.75 dB. So we lost over half of our power. Yep. It wouldn't be very good coax for UHF, would it? Nope. See what the chart says. Not Four, at that length. 400 megahertz, we should have about uh, Three, 4 four dB nine. loss. Yeah, 3.9 on the belt and 4.2 over on the JSC. That's kind of close to... It's fairly close, yeah. Yeah, to what we thought we're saying. There again, you know, we, we're not accounting for the loss in the connectors or the adapters. Here. Yeah, so... Yeah, so we got a PL259 to the uh, type in. Yeah. So let's get really serious with it. Now let's jump on up to 900 megahertz, which is just crazy to use RG8. Well, there's 900 megahertz yeah, right there. in the center. It's actually off a little bit because I shifted the frequency a minute ago. Minus 18.2, minus 18.3 dB. So that's 8.3 dB loss wow. over where we started. 6.5 on the building. I can't see the other. What is that? 6.8. 6 6.8. But we're seeing uh, more than that right here. PL259s are not very good connectors. Well, they're not good. For, they're not for the best for those high frequencies no. like that. So we, we've got additional loss in that in the adapters there. Maybe we should have put the gold ones on there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. That actually might be a good experiment. Yeah. If if we just 
<laughs> Scoot on down there. Let's let's just go crazy here. Let's go out to uh, 1.5 gigahertz. We've got you know 11 dB a loss or more there. So you know. Yeah, I don't. You want, might as I don't well, want to use any of that. You might as well just hook up a dummy load. I don't want to use any of that for my microwave. All right, so that was RG8U. Now I just happen to have over here, this is LMR400 cable here, which is a little better than the RG8. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff. It's a, a good replacement for Some uh, people call RG8. it poor man's hard line. Yeah. I don't have 100 feet. I've only got 50 feet here, but, I mean, that's easy enough to do the math. Although Matt, Mike wasn't expecting any math tonight. I think we yeah, can get you can by. sit this math out, Mike. <laughs> and this is a DXE four hundred Max. This came from DX Engineering. It's their uh, uh, LMR four hundred brand cable. Now the real LMR four hundred is made by Times Microwave. They're the original folks. So we've got them on the left, and the DX Engineering on the right. If you scan down the chart there, you'll see, you know, there's a little difference between the two of them. 450 megahertz, 2.7 on the times, 3.3 on the DX Engineering. A little, little more loss on the DX Engineering than on the times microwave there. But there again, you know, that's not the best thing to be using for UHF. Right. So let's go back to our analyzer here. Let's let's start over. Let's start what over. What is the it. best thing to use for UHF? Uh, Heliax, or hams call it hardline. Broadcast engineers don't call it that, but but hams do. Hardline is something else. Yeah. We've got the bump down here at the at the lower end of it. That's you know kind of throwing off things for us a little bit, and around one kilohertz. But let's say that you know. We're roughly maybe, uh, what, minus 8 down. We scoot on out to 1 megahertz. You know, we've added a little change to it, not much. You know, out here at the beginning, we are a little over, you know, about 9.5 dB for reference, or let's say. Go out to 100 megahertz, right around in there. Yep. Uh, just a fraction of a dB, 450 megahertz approximately. We've lost about 2.25 dB. For 450 megahertz, that's about 2.7. But we're using the DX Engineering. It says about 3.3. All right, so we're doing a little better than the... No, we're not. <laughs> we haven't taken into account the connectors. That's 3.3 dB loss. 450 megahertz for 100 feet. We've only got 50 feet. So, what, 1.7? Uh, yeah, roughly 1.7. Got a little better than two, but, you know, our, our connectors are, mm -hmm. are part of the problem there. So, let's see. Where can we go next? Well, that's as high as they rate this cable. Although, times microwave goes, goes way on up there. Let's just try 900 megahertz. Minus 13.6, roughly. So, about a 3.6 dB loss for 50 feet. Our chart says 3.9 dB loss for 100 feet. No, that's so, not adding up. Well, except the loss in the connectors, you know. That must be really a lot. Well, there, there is. It's double. Nobody would ever consider using PL 259s at 900 Except megahertz. Except us. That's just how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> or, or don't roll. So anyway, that's, that's just to show you as frequency increases, attenuation increases as well. And some cables more so than others. If we had a good piece of 100 feet of Heliax here to check out, we'd see it didn't have nearly as much loss, although there would still be some. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get rid of cable loss on long lengths and high frequencies, but some cables are definitely better than others. Yeah. Oh, you're, yeah, you're going to have some loss on any cable. Yeah, if we had hooked up a piece of RG58 here, it, uh, 100 feet of that, it would have been shameful. I have a 50-foot piece. You do? Yeah. I, I don't. It's, it's in my shed hanging up. I don't use it, but yeah. it's there. That would have been bad. Yeah. 
That would have been really bad. I might have to do that sometime just for fun, just to see. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we could. Well, I think that's about all we can say about that subject right now. That was plenty. That was plenty, yeah. yeah. That was interesting, though. Yeah. Well, when you can actually see it in the real world, that, yeah, cable loss does add up. Uh, if you looked also on those charts, you would have seen that... Um, they were telling you a little bit more information on there, like uh, how much power you can run. If you notice down at uh, 30 megahertz, you can run 3.33 kilowatts into it. So what's the lesson from all this? The lesson from all this? Pay is, attention to your cable charts and get the best cable you can afford to get. Exactly. Especially if you're going to go to higher frequencies. Yeah. You're going to need a better cable. If you're going to work down around um, HF, the same lesson is right there. 100 you feet. You can save a lot of money. Uh, yeah, the LMR 400, 100 feet is going to be at 50 megahertz, 0.9 dB attenuation. All right, that's LMR 400. That's a little more expensive cable. If we go back and we look at the RG8 there, uh, 50 megahertz, 1.2 dB. So we've only added 0.3 not, dB. That's not a lot at those no, lower frequencies. At, the, at those frequencies. And, and, you know, HF is lower than 50 megahertz. And now, honestly, I just typically run uh, Mini 8, 8X mm -hmm. from, from my HF antenna. I, I, I use 8X on one of mine. And, uh, yeah, it, it works okay. So you can, you can use these cables all day long on HF frequencies. As a matter of fact, you see there was very little benefit from going to the uh, LMR 400 for mm -hmm. HF. Yeah, but if you're going to go up and run in uh, VHF and UHF, you might yeah. want to, especially in UHF, you may want to invest in a little bit better cable. Exactly. If, yeah. you, if um, you can afford it. Yeah, right. So look at 100 megahertz there. 1.7 dB loss at 100 megahertz on the RG8. Over on uh, the LMR 400, well, they don't have it on the chart, but... Uh, it's like 1.3, 1.2. Yeah. Something along in that line. So it's a little less. Mm -hmm. But you go up to 450 megahertz, 2.7 there. Uh, the RG8. It's going to be a little, be over over four. Four, little over four. Yeah. So it, it would make considerable so lose difference. over half your power. Yeah. Uh, so better coax, especially on UHF. You can get by with, you know, longer lengths of RG8X or RG8. On VHF, you'll be losing some power, though. But on on UHF, it'll kill you. All right. Well, I guess that's all we've got for tonight. Before we go, though, there's something that we always mention. Of course, you and I are, are sporting, you're sporting the ICOM swag tonight. Yeah, yeah from uh, Hambenchen. I'm sporting some of the old college swag here. Yeah, back from your uh, earlier college days. Yeah, back when I was a student back and not the a 70s. professor. Yeah. <laughs> So if we, I wanted to update my swag, where could I find some, some more stylish swag that would be appropriate? Well, it's funny you ask because we just so have a place, amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com, and you can get all the swag you want to wear there. And uh, more. And more. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got caps, T-shirts, uh, golf shirts, jackets, sweatshirts. Uh, there's some Amateur Logic and Ham College swag on there, so um, go get, go out there and check it out. And uh, a lot of people on there from Amateur Logic have been sending pictures in of themselves wearing the cap or the shirts and things like that. So if, mm -hmm. if you get some and uh, you want your picture on the show, send it in, and there's a good chance it'll make it. Those, those are always fun to see. And in between episodes, you can catch up with us at, uh, well, some social media websites. Like, uh, well, this one right here, facebook.com slash group slash ham college. Yep. Or slash amateur logic, either one. Uh, probably amateur logic's a little more active. Yep. And you can follow us on the Twitters. Ham co at ham college, and mm -hmm. we also have at amateur logic. Yep. And you notice we're not showing the Google Plus community on there. It's still going, but... Google Plus will be going away in April. They're shutting it down. So Yeah, I got an email today. It said uh, yeah. first, first or second of April that uh, it'll be gone. So 
If you got anything yep. out there you want, you better go get it. Yep. And if you want to learn more about uh, each episode, you can check out the official sub. You can check out the official. Even if you can't say yeah. it, you can go check out the official show notes. You can check out the wiki. I can say that. There you go. Amateurlogic.tv slash wiki. It's the uh, Amateur Logic and Ham College wiki all rolled up into one. Double for your money. That's a value right there. It's a bargain. <laughs> okay. Well, we appreciate everyone being with us here tonight. And... Uh, well, wow, we've got some studying to do. Yep. We do. <laughs> Before next month. Because these questions aren't going to get any easier. Yeah, they're getting tougher. This was a pretty rough one tonight. Yeah. You, it's a real testament. I mean, when the folks in the chat room just quit talking all together, the it no takes answers a lot. coming It in. takes a lot to get them to quit talking, too. It does. It really does. <laughs> all right. 7-3, everyone. See you again next yeah, month. Same three, everybody. But that's the way it goes. You know, we sweat for you guys to to make sure that <laughs> everybody is going to pass their exam. <laughs> okay. Well, we got, we got a better was, response than I thought it was. <laughs> reaching, that was reaching pretty far was, right there. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> a, to prevent stations from interfacing with one with one another. <laughs> a well, to prevent stations from interfering with one another. <laughs> yeah, you certainly wouldn't want them I mean, interfacing just, or communicating. Nope.